people joining me now in the studio is Eddie Thomas, who's lived and worked in South Sudan and has written extensively about the country. Eddie, thanks very much indeed for coming in. So has thanks it become that. a forgotten conflict, as the UN is suggesting? Well, I suppose in some ways it has. There, I mean, this is a year that's been full of crises, hasn't it? There's so much trouble happening around the world. And, and this story, which really erupted onto the news screens a year ago, um, people don't necessarily have the patience to keep following that while there's so many other troubles in the world. Now, today marks one year since the start of that conflict in South Sudan. What's the level of threat of famine there? Because, I mean, we're hearing that it's very high, but apparently the agriculture season is partially lost and gone. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, our, there are different systems of agriculture and of food economies in, in Sudan, and, and certainly many of them have been hit by the huge amounts of displacement uh, that have been forced on people and also by the spread of extreme violence which leads to a lot of looting of some of the things that are needed for people to keep feeding themselves. And of course as always this war com comes hardest for the civilian population. Yes, it's very heavy for the civilian population and as you were saying you, there is a big food crisis there at the moment. The UN has reportedly described it as the most you know, risky country. Uh, for famine uh, in the world today, so it's a and there, there's lots of contenders for that awful uh, title. But the government, though the South Sudanese government, is downplaying the possibility of famine, saying they had very good rains this year and crops have been successful. They, they allege gross exaggeration on the part of the aid agency. What's your response to that? Do, do you think they're they're lying, or is there some some you know, not get some truth there. Well, there are there are so many food systems in uh, in South Sudan. Um, there a lot of people still live in not what a, not a subsistence economy, but a kind of tr a subsistence economy that is being transformed by violence and by the slow penetration of markets. So um, all of those systems work in very different ways. Um, some. Some, they have some very complicated food economies, people that live off a kind of wet wetland pastoralism, which is almost unique in Af Africa. And that, that wetland pastoralist area is the area where a lot of the violence is taking place. So it is your sense that, that certainly a famine, if not upon them, is, is possibly there imminent is a, unless something is There is a risk. Is done. There is a very risk. And, and, it, and, and, also and it's not really the time to play politics. No, it's not. It definitely isn't. Now, now your book, A Slow Liberation, mm -hmm. that's the title of your latest book about the region, uh, and it's based on hundreds of interviews you conducted in 2012 and 2013. Yeah. Tell me about what you found there. Well, I guess um, the, the book was, uh, if you live in South Sudan and, and you meet South Sudanese people, I must say you, you don't have the same you don't necessarily have the kind of pessimism that characterizes our discussion today because people are really hoping for a change and a betterment in their in their country and they're really hoping for liberation and they've made very bold, brave steps towards it. You well, know, presumably you started interviewing people before the war actually started. Well, because, I mean, it's been yeah. a year, it, and you, you started it in 2012. So yeah. you, you can actually make a comparison between the levels of optimism that you found there, given the fact that this was a new nation full of hope. And then, of course, subsequently the war started, and, and what, you've see, what you saw in, in 2013 there. Well, it, that, in a way, what you're saying is right. And in a way, it's, it's, it's something different, because... The, air, the, the area that I chose to tell the story of South Sudan from is an area called Jongale, which is part of Upper Nile State, or Upper Nile, the Greater Upper Nile region, sorry. And, and that area is the most kind of mutinous periphery of South Sudan. So although South Sudan had a big peace agreement in 2005, which was supposed to resolve many of the contradictions that it in, had inherited from a terrible colonial period and a terrible series of post-colonial uh, insurrections and mutinies and, revol rev and revolutions, that area was 
enmeshed in violence from about 2007 onwards. There was a, a terrible amount of violence happening there. There were huge, massive attacks from one community against another community with a sort of mysterious presence of the government in it or out of it at different times. And I was trying to, to look at some of the reasons why violence was so persistent. And I think, although I was writing before the current mm. dreadful crisis started, there, There's been a history of violence there, be, basically. Yeah, I think the structures that I was looking at are very important for people to look at today when looking at, at the, the, the violence of today. So, so based on what you've said, I mean, I know your book collected a lot of statistical yeah, data yeah. and all of that, and, but obviously you, you talk to a lot of people, you, yeah. you follow closely the evolving situation yeah. there. I mean, what about the possibility of peace between the two sides? I mean, are you hopeful in that direction at all? Well, um, I guess when you look at the, uh, the, the, the way that the peace talks are structured, they're structured between two factions of a leadership that were in many ways the winners of the peace agreement and of the establishment of an independent state. Um, they were given huge responsibilities, they rewarded themselves richly for those responsibilities and there's been a dramatic failure of political leadership which even uh, they, they themselves have acknowledged in, in, in their many peace conferences. Um, I, many of the diplomats who are working on uh, resolution are looking for a, a restitution of the status quo as it was before. And, and that's, that's impossible, do you think? I mean, well, Riek Machar and Salva Kiir, do they have to leave the stage in order for South Sudan to move forward? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I wouldn't like to say that because it's very unlikely that they would leave the stage. And, and I sincerely hope for peace for South Sudan. But I think what I was trying to focus on was the structural reasons that any future peace government would have to address. And what would those be those structures? That they well, if I could give an example. Sure. So in nine, the first civil war, many people date it to about nine, a mutiny in a barracks in 1955. But it took about eight years before the, the mutineers were able to control a significant bit of territory. The second civil war was in 1983, and it was also a mutiny in a barracks. And it took about three months for them, for the rebels, to control significant territory. This civil war began a year ago. It took three days before the rebels um, controlled a significant amount of territory. Why was it so quick? It's because of the huge number of contradictions in South Sudanese society and the terrible way, the complicated and terrible way in which the government relates to people uh, and uh, how that's got worse and worse over the years. I think I'm going to have to refer people to your book to yeah. get a better sense of this, mm. these um, contradictions you're talking about. Um, people who want to get a copy of that book briefly, where can they get it and when will it be out? It will be out at the beginning of January. I think on the 8th of January, and it's available from the publisher Z and also from good bookshops and uh, online booksellers. And that's South Sudan, A Slow Liberation yeah. by Edward Thomas. Thank yeah. you very much indeed Thank for coming Thank you for inviting in. me.